Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and we've just been talking, Mike and I, my guest Mike Bechtold is back, about how the learning process progresses and how we are excited by things and that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about the 100th anniversary of the Royal Canadian Air Force but through uh, a collection of objects. So it's about how objects and, and, and artifacts can help tell a story. So if you're new to the channel because we're a different time of day, welcome aboard. Everything you need is in the description below but without further ado, I'll bring Mike in um how are you today mike hey woody thanks for having me back i'm always uh, thrilled to uh, to join you on the show i'm doing very well thank you cool Th thrilled is a bit of an overstatement that's just I'm me thrilled. But, um, Absolutely. Well, that's, i'll take it um <laughs> so this project the 100th anniversary you know it's one of those things that's going to be happening more and more we have the 100th anniversary of the first world war a few years ago and it's now the 80th of 1944 and uh, those that way of looking at history through these benchmark eras is reminding us how far in the past our interest kind of starts you know because you know when i was a kid the 60s was just 20 years ago now it's now it's 50 so the, the, the hump anniversary of an air force when we think of it as a as a new branch it's it's no longer new is it <laughs> No, it's been with us for for our lives and and quite a bit longer. And uh, yeah, I, I, the, the anniversary thing is something that I, I don't quite understand. I think it's a media generation. They love round numbers, 50, 75, 100. And uh, here we are at the centenary centennial of the, the Royal yeah. Canadian Air Force formed on uh, the 1st of April, 1924. And so because it's a big round number like 100, it's time to, to talk about it and celebrate it. Well, without further ado, I'll bring up your slide. So, folks, you know, you know the score. Fire away some questions, but this will be a slightly shorter show than than some of the regular ones. So, um, I'm going to hand over to Mike to take us through this, and uh, um, there we go. Over to you, Mike. Wonderful. Thanks, Woody. So, I've been working for the last two plus years on on the RCAF Centennial. Uh, I've been working for the Royal Canadian Air Force's History and Heritage Section, doing a, a bunch of different projects. But probably the biggest one was a. Uh, uh, a book called uh, 100 Objects for 100 Years. And I'm going to talk to you about some of the stories from, from that book today, because I think uh, I think these 100 object book, 100 year, 100 object books are a really interesting way of, of looking at history. Um, this, um, this talk I'm going to give for you today is a little bit different than your normal uh, talks on this show. We're not talking about a particular battle. We're not talking about uh, a campaign or anything like that. We're going to talk about material history. And what I love about this approach to history is that we're going to take these really innocuous objects, something that you might not even give a second look to or, or give a second thought to. And I'm going to kind of take it and twist it for you and and hopefully use it as a, a window to open up onto a, a, an unknown history to tell some stories that might have been overlooked or missed. I hate to use forgotten because mm -hmm. that's uh, overused, but in, in some ways it, it's not too far wrong. So for the next oh, 35, 40 minutes or something like that. I want to take you through some objects from, from this book that was recently published. Um, as long as you do the spoon. I'm surprised we didn't get any comments saying, what about the spoon? <laughs> but uh, you, you will please promise you'll do the spoon. <laughs> I, the spoon is, is front and center. We'll definitely be yeah. talking about the spoon. So this is the book, and uh, I'm pleased to say that it is uh, freely available to you thanks to the Government of Canada and the Royal Canadian Air Force. Um, in fact, while you're watching or, or after the show, you can go online and, and download the PDF. Um, easiest way is just to uh, to Google 100 Objects RCAF, and you'll you'll find it easily enough. But I will have the link at, at the end of the, the show if you want to look at it directly. Um, this was a book that um, I was helped with in writing by um, uh, Brad St. Croix, who's a, an old friend of this show, and I suspect he's out there watching today. I know he's over in Normandy. Uh, We're meeting up at the pub later. Exactly, exactly. I wish I could join you. And uh, Richard Maine, who was the, uh, or who is the um, chief historian of the Royal Canadian Air Force History and Heritage Section. So together, the three of us uh, picked these objects, wrote about them, and hopefully there's something new in here for each and every one of you to learn. And I want to, I mean, there's 100 objects in the book. They're all my favorites, but I kind of picked some that are, are particularly apropos to this show um, the objects in the book go all the way back to the Silver Dart, uh, which was the first heavier-than-air aircraft to fly in, in Canada in 1909. There's some objects from the, the pre-RCAF period and then a lot from the, uh, the post-Second World War. But we'll stick to the, uh, the Second World War period for the, the purposes of this show. All the objects in the book were, were selected from RCAF museums across the country. And this map just gives you a, a quick look at where those museums are. They go all the way from the uh, the East Coast and, and Shearwater and, and Greenwood in Nova Scotia, 
Labrador and in, in Goose Bay, uh, uh, Newfoundland, all the way to the West Coast and Comox out on Vancouver Island. And there's 11 of those in total. Just and, a day trip. And it's solely to see all just them. A day trip. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can just uh, drive from one to another and see them all in a day. Not. <laughs> um, th these 100 Objects books have been a, I don't want to say fad because I don't think that's fair. But if you go on Amazon and Google 100 Objects and War or 100 Objects and uh, Air Force or anything like that, and you'll find all sorts of these. And I just picked a, a few. I, I went through these when I was conceiving this project because I wanted to understand what people have done and sort of what is out there, how are people approaching it. Uh, Gary Sheffield's book on the First World War is, is really well done. Um, Roger Morehouse's book on the Third Reich, I have problems with the Third Reich and, and Nazism, and I'm not sure it's something I'd want to promote, but that's that's a story for another day. His book is well done, but the one thing I noticed about his book is that it's very generic. He takes an 88 millimeter anti-aircraft gun. He takes a German helmet. He takes a, a German uniform and, and kind of tells the story of those in a, in a big way. Uh, a big way, but there's no personal connection. And, and that's something that I always look for, um, especially in museums, because when I go to the museum, if I see a, a Sherman tank or a Ross rifle or uh, whatever object is in there, yes, that object is, is neat on its own. But for me, what really brings it alive is the story of that particular object. Where was that object? What did it do? How does it uh, specifically play into this story. So one of the big things that I, I made sure happened with a vast majority of the objects in this book is that they are all tied to a specific person, a specific event, um, a specific time, so that we can say that this isn't just a uh, wooden spoon, uh, to use Woody's example. It's a wooden spoon that was carved by Len Birchall when he was in a POW camp. Um, so I think, I think those are things that really take the story to a, a different level than it would be if you just are presenting um, a Spitfire or something like that. So anyway, there's lots of these books out there. Um, I had to throw in Star Wars because I don't often get to talk about Star Wars, but there you go. Oh, you can talk about Star Wars and 100 Objects as well. Just a, a quick timeline for you. The uh, the RCAF, as I mentioned, started on the 1st of, of April, 1924, but that wasn't the beginning of the Air Force experience for Canadians. Um, there was four what I call proto air forces that were in existence. Um, the Canadian Aviation Corps, the, the first Canadian Air Force, which was formed in the First World War, uh, the Royal Canadian uh, Naval Air Service, which lasted for a very short period of time. And then the Canadian Air Force was brought back again in Canada uh, after the end of the, the First World War. And then that doesn't even count the experience of all the Canadians who served in the, the British flying services in the First World War, um, as much as 25% as of all pilots were, were Canadian, which is really quite a, a remarkable number. Um, the RCAF, as we know it, existed from 1924 to 1968. Uh, then there was this thing called unification, where the government thought it was a good idea to disband each of the individual forces and, and create the, the Canadian forces or the Canadian armed forces. Um, soon realized that maybe this wasn't the best thing, so an Air Force identity was brought back with Air Command in 1975. And finally, the, the, the proper name, Royal Canadian Air Force, was brought back in, in 2011 and exists again today. So there's a whole uh, space of, of the RCAF, but of course, we're only going to really be talking about the 39 to, to 45 period here today. So there we have it, that wooden spoon. And, and what I'm going to do is sort of show an object. And uh, I, I kind of wish I was in person with you and I'd take some uh, audience participation questions about what is this and what could it be, but uh, we're not going to do that today because I think that would be a little bit cumbersome. But this is a, a spoon that was carved by uh, squadron leader, leader Len Birchall when he was in a, a Japanese uh, prisoner of war camp. And um, his, his story is interesting. He's known as the savior of, of Ceylon. He flew uh, Catalinas with 413 Squadron, uh, an RCAF squadron that was sent over to the uh, the CBI, the China Burma India Theater, in 1942. Um, Soon after he arrived, I think it was on the 4th of April, uh, 1942, he was out on a mission and he spied the Japanese fleet that was making a, a sortie towards uh, Ceylon, uh, was able to give the, the British uh, ample warning to get most of their ships out of, of the harbor at Colombo. And uh, though the, the 
Indian Ocean sortie was a, a big victory for the Japanese. It wasn't an overwhelming victory as it might have been because of the, the warning that uh, Birchill was able to provide. Um, unfortunately, Birchill was shot down uh, just after he sent his message. Uh, six Japanese zeros from the, the carrier Hiryu uh, shot him down. Um, Hiryu, of course, was subsequently sunk at the Battle of Midway uh, a few months later. But uh, Birchall got the message out and uh, then spent the rest of the war in a, a Japanese prisoner of war camp. And he was absolutely crucial. He was a big personality. He did everything in his power to make sure that his men were well looked after, well treated. He was uh, suffered repeated beatings because he would intervene when the Japanese were mistreating his men. And uh, he would put himself in the line of fire to save his men. And he worked really hard to drop the, the death rate in his POW camps. It was uh, at one time as high as 30%, but through his uh, actions and interventions at, at times, he dropped it down to less than 2%, which is was pretty uh, important. And the spoon for me is, is really important because it is a uh, tangible connection yep. to the man that Birchall was in those prisoner of war camps, that he worked hard, he had very little um, uh, in terms of resources to the point where he had to carve his own spoon um, because they weren't provided. Um, Birchall, this, uh, the photo on, on your left is a photo of the 413 uh, crews before they went over to Burma. I don't know if I can point on this screen, but uh, no, you Birchall, can't afford to just have to describe. Uh, Birchall is in the back row, right in the center, almost underneath the, the window. You can see he's got a, a battle dress uniform rather than the RAF. Uh, RCAF uniform. Um, the photo on the right is is Birchall in 2000, sorry, 1995, when he went over to uh, uh, Burma or, or what is it, Myanmar now, to Myanmar. unveil a, a, a monument to 413 Squadron. And Birchall had a, a really impressive career. He is the longest serving member of the Canadian Armed Forces in history, uh, 62 years in, in uniform. Uh, you can see his... Um, Canadian Forces decoration on the right, or our right, his left. Uh, he's got five bars to the Canadian Forces decoration, the most of anybody who served. Uh, there are some of the uh, the monarchy who have the same or slightly more, but uh, yeah, really, really impressive man. And uh, this is something we can understand through that simple wooden spoon. So uh, a felt hat, it's actually a Polish felt hat. Um, in really good condition considering when it went through, but it belonged to a uh, irk named uh, Gordon Green, who was a uh, engine uh, mechanic in Burma with four, uh, 436 squadron, uh, not 435. That was the one that uh, Norma talked so brilliantly about earlier in the week, but it's sister squadron. And uh, this this hat is is for me really quite amazing. We've got this photograph of uh, Gordon uh, and his brother Jim in Burma. Gordon's on the left, his brother Jim is on the, the right. And they both joined up for the, the Air Force, uh, went through training to be ground crew, those important guys who made sure the, the airplanes kept flying and, and everything like that. And this hat was with him throughout his entire time in, in Burma. And I think it really speaks to the quality of the production of the hat that it spent uh, many, many months in theater, in the hot, sweaty, rainy uh, weather, and it still looks almost brand new today. He uh, brought it home with him after the war and uh, went to his daughter and, and subsequently was donated to the uh, Air Force Museum of Alberta. Should have mentioned earlier that on the, the right side of the screen, I put the museum where these yep. objects can be found, just in case anybody's interested in in following up on them. Just to just but, add my little two, two pennies worth it, I always find it interesting what artifacts men or women who served decided to bring back because sometimes you think, well that's that's an odd one but then there's always a story behind it isn't it you know we might think oh it's to bring back the denison smock bring back the practical stuff and obviously lots of rucksacks and jerry cans and stuff like that were were used but the actual personal items often can be really quite quite obscure yeah very much so and i i think this this object is particularly important because we don't have as much from the the guys behind the scenes it tends to be objects that are, are from the, the the Brill Cream Boys, the, the fighter pilots, the bomber crew, and, and stuff like that. And there seems to be less from 
uh, the the irks, the the maintainers, the guys who were uh, doing all the essential tasks behind the scenes, but perhaps weren't in in the thick of the fighting. Um, Gordon had a, a little side business, and I love the photo on the right. Um, laundry was always a problem in in Burma, and uh, he set up his own little business on the side, built a a washing machine, and would uh, take commissions to do the laundry for his. Uh, his fellow uh, airmen, and uh, I think that's just great. Um, 436 Squadron was the uh, the leading uh, Dakota squadron in the theater, uh, carried more tonnage than any other uh, squadron um, between Burma and India and other places. And a lot of that has to do with uh, the efforts of the, the IRCs to make sure these uh, aircraft kept flying. The, uh, the men took, a, a, I guess, an oath is maybe a little too strong, but um, in between missions, rather than uh, doing up a, a, a heated meal, they would just eat cold rations so they could turn around faster. And under direction of the, the senior engineering officer, they were able to get engine replacements down from three days, which was the norm, down to, to two days. And it, it's guys like Gordon Green that were absolutely key in, in making that happen. So these are, these are the stories you can uh, sort of tease out from a, a rather bland object like a felt hat. All right, this is something that airmen would have carried in the, the, the CBI in case they were, were shot down to ensure their, their safety um, because there was uh, lots of problems with um, being treated as an enemy because the, the locals often wouldn't know who these people were or where they came from and would often make the assumption that they were uh, the enemy. This is a, a safe conduct pass that belonged to uh, Gabriel Tassero who flew with uh, 425 Squadron, uh, the Alouette Squadron, uh, a bomber squadron in, in Northwest Europe. We're not actually sure how he got this uh, safe conduct pass because it's um, clearly from the uh, the Far East in the Second World War, but um, Tashro himself never served there. So I don't know if he picked it up as a, a souvenir or, or traded it with uh, somebody he crossed paths with, but it stands as a, a really interesting artifact. and. The uh, safe conduct passes were often known as a, a, a ghoulie pass, a ghoulie uh, ticket, uh, which comes from, a, I think, a Hindu word for testicle, um, which is, I, if this is true, and I can't confirm that it is, but the story goes that uh, downed airmen in the First World War would often be, um, uh, would often be uh, castrated for their efforts, and so the, the ghoulie chit was a way to protect their their ghoulies. Uh, so I understand. Whatever days of school, I never I never knew that, Mike. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. That, that's where it comes from. And uh, this one in particular, I'll read what it says. It's in um, sixteen different Southeast uh, Asian wow. languages: Malay, Burmese, Tamil, Thai, etc. And it says, uh, "Dear friend, I am an Allied fighter. I did not come here to do any harm to you, who are my friends." I only want to do harm to the Japanese and chase them away from this country as quickly as possible. If you will assist me, my government will sufficiently reward you when the Japanese are driven away. So that's a very blunt way of yeah. saying, uh, help me and I will reward you for your efforts. So it stands as uh, an interesting souvenir from the uh, period. And, and that can be found at the, the Bagoville Air Defense Museum in Quebec. This is, this is perhaps my favorite object in the book, um, although I, I know as a father I'm not supposed to have favorites. But no, you're not supposed to. It's not very objective of you, Mike. No, it's not. But this is, this is one that I think is, is extraordinarily important because it is just an average um, Air Force rescue axe, the kind of axe that was issued to air crew could be found on uh, every bomber that, that flew over uh, Allied territory in case of a crash to, to help them. Uh, chop their way out. But this particular axe, and it is the exact axe, was used by this man, pilot officer Andrew Minarski, um, who many of you might know was a uh, uh, an air gunner in the RCAF 419 squadron. And on the 12th of, of June 1944, just after D-Day, his uh, squadron was sent on a, a mission to bomb the rail yards at, at Cambrai. They were ambushed by a German night fighter. Two of their engines were set on fire, and uh, the captain ordered the, the Lancaster to abandon the crew to abandon the aircraft. Um, Minarski was all getting set just to uh, to jump out of the aircraft when he looked to the, the tail and saw that the tail gunner Pat Brophy, who was his best friend, was trapped. The uh, attack had jammed the, the rear turret 
and uh, Brophy couldn't get out. So Monarski uh, put off uh, jumping to his own uh, safety and went back to, to try to help his friend. And the, the aircraft was on fire by that point. He had to go through the, the fuselage, really tight, cramped quarters, and the, the aircraft would have not been very stable as it as it went down in flames. But he took that ax and tried to, uh, to chop Pat Brophy out. And uh, unfortunately, he wasn't successful. Uh, ended up having to uh, turn around and jump out of the aircraft while he was still on fire. He uh, he landed um, landed hard, and a, a combination of his uh, injuries from the burns and his injuries from the the, the hard landing meant that he died uh, shortly thereafter and didn't survive. Uh, you might be asking, how do we know this story? Well, Pat told the story. Uh, somehow, against all odds, when the aircraft crashed, uh, Pat Brophy's rear turret was thrown clear. Uh, Brophy was ejected from the turret and he was banged up, but he survived as a, a prisoner of war and, and told this remarkable story. In fact, I use his exact words um, quoted in, in the book to tell the story because you can't do a better job of, of telling the story. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how uh, um, Minersky was a, a flame as he came to the back, that he worked until his uh, uh, he couldn't do anything more to get him out, uh, returned to the, the door. And just before he jumped out, he uh, stood at attention and, and snapped off a, a salute and, and jumped out of the aircraft. Absolutely um, heroic beyond all means and, and for his actions based on Brophy's testimony, Minarski was awarded the Victoria Cross, the British Commonwealth's highest award for uh, gallantry in the face of the enemy. And uh, hey, Stephen, did, did he lose his hair from this? Uh, Brophy yeah. or... Manaski, I don't know. Manarski? I honestly don't know. I don't know. Interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, but what what I find all the more remarkable is that this is the exact axe. After yeah. the uh, the Lancaster crashed, uh, local French civilians found the axe and uh, kept it safe for uh, many years. And um, actually, yes, uh, Stephen, I think uh, I do remember hearing that Brophy had some hair burned off and the patches didn't ever okay. come back the way they had been before. Thank you. But uh, yeah, they, they found this and, and when a, a couple of other men from the, the crew went and visited uh, years later, they were presented with this ax and they brought the ax back to Canada, uh, gave it to uh, 419 Squadron in Cold Lake. And um, here we, we still have it today, which is absolutely remarkable. So the, uh, actually I realized my note on the side is a little bit incorrect. The, the Victoria Cross is held by the uh, Air Force Heritage Museum in Winnipeg, but the uh, the axe itself is held by uh, 419 Squadron and, and the museum in, in Cold Lake, Alberta. So anyway, absolutely remarkable story. And, and the fact that we have the, the, the literal axe from that engagement mm. is quite interesting. So on the, the left is a, a statue of, of Monarski that was uh, unveiled in uh, Vimy Park in Winnipeg. And on the right is a, a photo of Monarski's crew. Monarski is, is front and center, the really long hair. And uh, Pat Brophy is on the left uh, wearing the, the cap. I have to say that is about the most amazing statue I've ever seen. I mean, I've got some, you know, the Green Howard's one in Crepon in Normandy. And that is, that's absolutely stunning. Yeah, I've never it, seen that before. I mean, no, why would I? I live in Normandy, but amazing. <laughs> Yeah, Winnipeg. Winnipeg is one of those places where you have to intend to be going there. It's not something you just find yourself uh, in that city. Brilliant. All right. Next, we have a, a beat up old suitcase, uh, almost a, a trunk. And uh, again, an absolutely unremarkable object. Uh, it's so beat up. It's been written all over. Who would want to keep that? But this allows us to tell the story of, of Flight Sergeant Jack Davey, who was a... Um, uh, a fighter pilot uh, with, um, well, number of squadrons, but eventually ended up with 112 squadron in North Africa flying uh, Kitty Hawks. And uh, he was a Canadian, uh, joined up, might be getting my story wrong. I think he tried to join the RCAF and joined the RAF. No, he joined the RCAF and was posted to an RAF squadron. Flew a bunch of missions and Spitfires out of England, uh, intruder sorties over, over the continent, but then was sent to North Africa and joined... 112 squadron. Um, he only flew a few missions with them before he was involved in a, an attack on, on Tobruk on the 18th of May, 1942. 
and uh, he disappeared during the mission. Nobody knew what happened to him. His uh, squadron got pretty badly shot up over Tobruk by anti-aircraft fire. Um, one of his uh, uh, squadron mates was, was shot down. Uh, another dove solo um, during a strafing attack that his propeller hit the, the ground and uh, survived, uh, but crash landed um, short of the airbase getting back. But nobody knew what happened to Davy. He just wasn't there at the end of the mission. So they assumed that he got hit by anti-aircraft fire or, or perhaps um, had to, to crash because his aircraft was damaged. And they were all pretty sure that he was going to show up at some point, either walking in from the desert or um, being uh, notified that he was a German prisoner of war. And, and in fact, when his mother wrote to the, the squadron commander to ask about him. That's exactly what the squadron leader said. We have no no doubt that he's going to turn up somewhere, blah, blah, blah. But as it as it occurred, um, we still haven't found Davy to this point. We don't know where he crashed or, or what happened, if he crashed into the, the Mediterranean, uh, if he crashed somewhere in the desert and is still lying out there, but he's, he's just gone. Um, after it was clear that he wasn't coming back, his gear was, was packed up in, in two trunks and sent back first to England and then over to Canada. Somewhere, somewhere along the lines, one of the trunks went missing. It happened to be the one that had a bunch of um, Rolex watches and other expensive things. I'd like to think that it just got lost, but it probably got pinched and, and uh, reutilized by somebody. But this suitcase did make it home and was preserved by the family. And I'm, I'm really glad it is because it, it really is the story of, of Jack Davy. It's like the equivalent of his high school yearbook. Because if you take some time to, to look at the notations on it, it tells everything about his, uh, his Air Force career. He's got, you can kind of see upside down, it says uh, JV uh, Davy there. There's a picture of a, a Spitfire in the, well, the bottom right corner, but our top left corner. That he drew but then if you look at all of the the notations it tells his story he's got the names of all the places that he was posted during his career um, during his enlistment and, and training uh, during his passage to england halifax Reykjavik, and, and greenock scotland his stations in the uk uh, he then took the the takarati route um, to get to his squadron in in the middle east and for those of you that know, basically they were sent on a ship to the, the west coast of, of Africa, um, docked at, at Takarori, or it looks like he was docked. It at, came up on World War II TV in a show. We did it. We did it. We did a whole show on it, basically. Yeah. Oh, fascinating story. But it's got all the stops along the way, and then his his locations with uh, 112 Squadron. Really, really remarkable stuff. Mm. And, and then also, if you look closer, he's got signatures from uh, people that he came across, squadron mates, and stuff like that. With with their hometowns, there's uh, there's Canadians, there's there's Brits, there's New Zealanders, there's Indians, and it's just such a remarkable object. And uh, even even though we've lost Jack, even though we don't know where Jack is, somehow he lives on through this suitcase, which I think is is incredibly uh, uh, moving. Yeah, remarkable. So there's some uh, photos of of Jack. Um, 112 Squadron was known for having the, the shark's mouth on the, the front of the Kitty Hawk. But yeah, this is this is all we have of him. And, and we're more, we're richer for having the, the suitcase, which is at the Air Force Museum of Alberta. All right, this is kind of a weird photo because the way it was photographed, we kind of lose the bottom half. But this is a, a ring made out of uh, aircraft uh, plexiglass. And uh, you can see it's got the uh, initials VS in it for uh, Verna Stronic. Now, Verna Stronic was a, a young uh, girl who lived just outside of Greenwood um, uh, Air Force Base uh, in uh, Nova Scotia. And she was 15 in, in 1942. And uh, the, the base was an active base, uh, location of a, a number of uh, OTUs, operational training units during the war. And uh, flying, especially Hudson's, those are the planes that are shown in that photograph. And on, uh, what was the date for that? Here we have it. June 25th, 1942, a, uh, a Hudson crashed just, uh, just after takeoff. And uh, for weeks afterwards, Verna and her, her friends would cycle up to the crash site just to have a look at what's going on. But I, I suspect more to, to talk to the, uh, the airmen that were left behind to, to guard it. And uh, I don't know, I've got a, a 15 year old daughter, so I could see how that kind of a dynamic would, would develop. 
but uh, one of the airmen, we don't know who, he was probably British, RAF, um, uh, got to know her very well. Uh, he was subsequently posted back to England, but he had taken a piece of the aircraft, a piece of the, the plexiglass, and carved it into a ring, put her initials on it, and sent it back to her as a sort of a, a sweetheart gift. And uh, she kept that with her for the rest of her life and uh, subsequently uh, donated it to the, uh, the Greenwood Military Aviation Museum. And this, uh, this I think, is, is an important artifact because it's not what we usually think of when we think of the RCAF. But the Air Force had a, a big impact on the local communities where they mm -hmm. were, were based, that um, it wasn't just the, the employment for uh, people who lived there, but it was the impact with the, the locals, the connections that were made with the, with the locals to the point where somebody would, would I don't know, how long would it take to, to make a ring like that? Hours and hours and hours um, just to, to do it as a, a, a gift. And uh, I think it really shows something about what's happening behind the scenes, um, not on the battlefronts, not in the dogfights in the air. All right, this is a, an odd little thing that when I first saw a picture of it, I'm like, what the heck is this? Uh, turns out this is, oh, I can't ask, I would ask normally, does anybody know what this is? Um, it's a caterpillar uh, with two red jewels for eyes, and it's um, given by the, uh, the Urban Parachute Company to pilots who have been saved by parachute. And this particular one belonged to uh, Skeet Ogilvy, who was a, a Canadian pilot who served with the, the RAF, uh, especially during the, the Battle of Britain. Um, he had originally tried to join up with the RCAF, was denied made his way over to England on his own, joined the RAF, was accepted, uh, flew extensively with the RAF during the Battle of Britain, uh, received, um, I think he was with 609 Squadron, um, had six uh, claims for, for kills during the, the Battle of Britain, including in one occasion where he shot down a, a German bomber just as it was about to, uh, to drop its bombs on Buckingham Palace. Uh, and he was subsequently awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for his, his efforts that day. Now, uh, his story continued after the Battle of Britain. He flew missions over uh, the continent, the, the ramrods and intruder missions and, and so forth after the Battle of Britain was over. We could talk a, a lot about that because I think it's a really interesting period for the RAF as it tries to find a, a new role for itself that's uh, offensive rather than defensive. But he was uh, ended up being shot down on, on the 4th of July, 1941, was uh, pretty severely injured, but survived thanks to his, his parachute and ended up in a, a German prisoner of war camp. And usually that would be the end of, of the story for his war, but uh, his continued on because he happened to find himself in Luftstallag three. that if anybody knows about that, we'll connect that with the, uh, the great escape. He was uh, an integral member of the, the escape uh, team and was uh, one of the guys who who made it out of the uh, the tunnel. I think he was last or second last to emerge from the t uh, the tunnel. He survived for a couple of days on the land before he was recaptured. And very fortunately for him, he was one of the ones that was returned to camp, not one of the fifty that was was executed. So he ended up uh, making it back to uh, to Canada after the war. And here's a couple photographs. The one on the left is him uh, on his passage back to Canada. And on the right, it's uh, a photograph, I think, with his parents and his wife on the right or his left. I like how she's got her arm linked in there and she's kind of lifting up the, the DFC, showing off uh, how uh, accomplished her, her husband is. But uh, he, uh, he stayed in the Air Force after the war while he transferred from the RAF to the RCAF and had a quite a successful career uh, post-war. So just another thing that he has that little pin that tells a, a big yeah. story for him. And I, I just wanted to finish off with this object that some people may recognize as a, an oxygen bottle, the, the type of oxygen bottle that was carried on, on Allied aircraft throughout the war, bombers, fighters, etc. But this one in, in particular was um, found at a, a crash site in, in Newfoundland just outside uh, uh, Green Goose, Green, Green, bleh. Blanking on the name of the, this. Welcome to my world, Mike. I'm always forgetting. Anyway, um, this was a, a, a Ferry Command Dakota that had gone from Montreal. It was stopping in Newfoundland before heading overseas. 
Um, we don't know why it crashed, um, probably because of the weather. We think that it was letting down in uh, really stormy, foggy conditions and misjudged the, the height of the land and ended up crashing. There was a, a search, but by the time the uh, search crews found it, uh, about 20 miles short of the airfield, uh, it was clear that all the uh, people on the aircraft were, were dead. The stories of these uh, men are, are really interesting because they're just the kind of stories that, okay, there's four more names on the various uh, honor rolls from the war. Um, the pilot was, was British. He was uh, RAF Volunteer Reserve, uh, Flying Officer Morris, 34. He was a, an experienced uh, uh, ferry command pilot. Um, the navigator was a, an RCAF, uh, a young lad, um, Archie Whitelaw. And uh, even though he was only 23, he was very experienced. He'd flown more than 40 uh, ferry command missions, uh, some across the North Atlantic, some across the, the South Atlantic, getting air crew on. And, and just so we can finish up on a, a Burma note, um, he was on his way to a, a new posting with uh, an RCAF transport squadron in Burma. I don't know if it was 435 or, or 436 squadron, but he was on his way over to, to have an operational command. Um, the radio officer was um, actually a civilian, uh, Thomas Woods, who was contracted by RAF uh, Transport Command to, to fly these missions. And then there was a, a passenger, Flying Officer McLaughlin, who was deadheading to the UK. He had to, to get over to the UK for his next posting and and was just along as a, uh, a passenger and, and they all didn't make it because of whatever reason, whether mechanical difficulties, we don't really know. And uh, this oxygen bottle was, was found in the wreckage. Somebody thought to save it and uh, it now stands with a, a plaque in the, the, the museum in, in Newfoundland. And it, it's again, one of these innocuous objects that if it wasn't around, would we remember Morris and Whitelaw and Woods and, and McLaughlin? I'd like to think so, but chances are they would just sort of disappear into that uh, catalog of, of losses from the war. But here we can tell a little bit about their, their stories and about their lives. And I, I think that makes this object incredibly remarkable, much more interesting than a plain old oxygen bottle. So anyway, that's all That's all I have to, to talk about today. Well, I mean, brilliant stuff. And... Um... It's got me thinking about the the whole use, as you said earlier, of, of objects. And I was in a museum not that long ago, and I won't say which one it is, but there was a uniform item that clearly had a big set of shrapnel holes in the back of it. And it was on display as a representation of the type of uniform. And I'm like, okay, sure, it is a, I won't say what it is, but surely, surely the story is, how it came to have all that shrapnel damage in the back and, and the museum hadn't put it there. And I thought, well, if, if they did, even if they don't know that, at least surely reference that and put that up as some poor person was probably wearing that when it was killed because there were no, interesting, that they, the, the item, there were no holes on the front. So it was on the back. So presumably they'd all just entered the person and the person, I assume, at least died, if not met a very, a lot of, a lot of injuries and wounds. So yeah, sometimes museums don't always know how to how best to tell stories. So um, thank you very much for, for shedding light on the art of storytelling through museums and through objects and, and, and today via, via YouTube. Yeah, um, my, my pleasure, Woody. I, I found this a really interesting research project because it was all about triangulating information. Sometimes there was information connected to it, but a lot of times I, I had to find the information by looking at different sources and, and connecting the dots in ways that they'd never been connected before. And it was yeah. a, a really satisfying research project to sort of bring these objects to life. Because in some cases, the museums that have these objects didn't know the stories behind them. It was just oh, a suitcase with all these names. Um, but when I uh, sort of put together that story and, and sent it out to them in Alberta, they're like, wow, this is amazing. We didn't know any of this and it's all gonna go into our, our displays now. So uh, yeah, it was really satisfying to to bring these stories to life and, and to be able to share them with everybody. And you know, bring, bringing up the, the bigger, uh, hard to answer question of, of how we will in the future convey the history of World War II to people who are distinctly younger than us, who've not come at it necessarily from the conventional books, war movies type way of understanding history, but um, through, through other media media and me, and I can just see that you know, uh, a TikTok 
videos of these objects going really well. You know, a spoon as an object and then a one minute long thing about where it comes from is, is a very fast, zippy kind of way of getting a story across to people who perhaps wouldn't walk through a military museum or wouldn't pick up, you know, a 600 page history of the Royal Canadian Air Force in World War Two. But would we might allow that person to just have a, a, a jolt of understanding of, of the past and how how what these people did? Yeah, I agree. And I mean, so many are interested in in planes and guns and tanks and, and things like that. And that, that really only scratches the surface of our, our understanding of the wars. And I think it's essential to sort of bring these stories to light. And I, I hope that um, everybody out there sort of downloads this book and has a look yep. through it. I've, I've talked about, what, eight or ten objects from the book, but there's a hundred in there. Actually, there's more than a hundred. Um, and in each of the stories is, is remarkable uh, that I tried to tried to touch the various different corners of, of the RCF history. It's mm -hmm. not just about the, the fighter pilots and it's not just about the wars. It's about um, the first women that served. It's about yeah. um, those people that were sort of radio operators and, and mechanics and others toiling behind the scenes that nothing could happen if, if they weren't doing their jobs. So. Yeah. And as you know, when you sent me the PDF, just the, the transition of the type of work the RCF is doing today or in the 70s and 80s that is totally removed from what they were doing in World War II or the years before. You know, it's an ongoing, mm -hmm. um, I would call it an organization because it, in some ways it is, it, it, it's like a, a business trying to keep up to date with the world around it in that an Air Force has to um, meet the, the requirements of the era it's in and therefore the personnel have to come through to, to meet and fulfill those requirements. It's ever morphing and ever evolving and and, and Canada has a, such a an interesting um, dynamic there because you know vast place and yet still a comparatively small population um you know and you know we were talking with norma the other day you know the, the amount of places canadians were in world war ii you kind of um you you batted out you, you batted above your out of your league there you know you were going above and beyond uh, no pun intended as we talked about the rcaf but um yeah there's lots of food for thought there and um uh, yeah so folks you know what to do go out there and um and get it basically get get the pdf and um or get a physical copy if you can Awesome. And Mike, we'll have to think of some other reason to bring you back in the future because uh, I, I love talking to you and uh, it's, been, it's been great. And thank you again. I always thank you because you're one of those early pioneers on World War II TV who came on and did stuff when it was a tiny little fledgling thing and a bit clunky. And it's, we're not much better now, but thank you for people like yourself giving me, giving me that, that good go ahead at the beginning. It's, it's very appreciated. Oh, happy to come back anytime, Woody. Brilliant, we'll do that. So, folks, nothing to worry about. Sunday afternoon, depending on where you are, Holly Harris is on talking about the experiences of American POWs, but not just American, in East Prussia. So now I'm looking forward to that and the understanding of what they brought back with them as well in terms of, of personal baggage uh, from that experience there. That's in the, in the Konigsberg area around there, Stalag Luft 1A. So we'll look forward to that one. So thank you, Mike. Thank you, viewers, for questions. I will see you on Sunday. Cheers, everybody. Bye. See you all. Bye.